Others walk in the highways, a few walk across lots. Roads are made for horses and men of business. I do not travel in them much. We think, of course, of Whitman's Song of the Open Road. Comparatively, because I'm not in a hurry to get to any tavern or grocery or livery stable or depot to which they lead. I'm a good horse to travel, but not from choice a roadster. The landscape painter uses the figures of men to mark a road. He would not make that use of my figure. I walk out into a nature such as the old prophets and poets, Menu, Moses, Homer, Chaucer walked in. You may name it America, but it's not America. Neither America's Vespucius nor Columbus nor the rest were the discoverers of it. There is a truer account of it in mythology than any history of America, so-called, that I have seen. Then uh, um, a few lines later he says, what is it that makes it so hard sometimes to determine whether we will walk? Now this is fun because in this essay he will actually ask the question, you walk out the door, you go, you know what, Thoreau is right. I'm going to take a walk this afternoon. So I walk out my door, question, which direction do I go? Like how do I know which direction to go? Do I just start walking in some general way? And then Thoreau is able to make these, very much like his pal Emerson, able to make these amazing observations. We think of Emerson's classic essay, Nature, in the next lines. He says, I believe that there's a subtle magnetism in nature, which if we unconsciously yield to it, will direct us aright. It's not indifferent to us which way we walk. There is a right way, and we are very liable from heedlessness and stupidity to take the wrong one. We would fain take that walk, yet never yet taken by us through this actual world, which is perfectly symbolical of the path which we love to travel in the interior and ideal world. Well, there it is, right? I mean, that notion that there's different kinds of walks. There's the physical, there's the spiritual, mental. And sometimes, no doubt, we find it difficult to choose our direction because it does not yet exist distinctly in our idea. When I go out of the house for a walk, uncertain as yet whether I will bend my steps and submit myself to my instinct to decide for me, I find, strange and whimsical as it may seem, that I finally and inevitably settle southwest towards some particular wood or meadow or deserted pasture or hill in that direction. He loves to say it's west that he loves to walk. He says eastward I go only by force, but westward I go free. We go eastward, he says, to realize history and study the works of art and literature, retracing the steps of the race. We go westward as into the future with a spirit of enterprise and adventure. And of course, those of us who live out here in the West, we love this idea of go west and all of that, right? And then a few lines later, he even quotes Chaucer from the opening lines of the general prologue, right? Um, the, the idea that people long to go on pilgrimages and all of that. You could argue that Chaucer stands in many ways behind most everything that, Charles, that, that, Thoreau, uh, that Thoreau did. A few lines later, he says, I believe the climate does thus react on man, as there is something in the mountain air that feeds the spirit and inspires. Will not man grow to greater perfection intellectually as well as physically under these influences? Or is it unimportant how many foggy days there are in his life? I mean, I mean brilliant, right? I trust that we shall be more imaginative, that our thoughts will be clearer, fresher, more ethereal as our sky, our understanding more comprehensive and broader like our plants, our intellect generally on a grander scale like our thunder and lightning, our rivers and mountains and forests, and our hearts shall even correspond in breadth and depth and grandeur to our inland seas. Uh, 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 now, writers have often said when they read Thoreau, if I could write one line as well as Thoreau writes thousands of these lines, I would have lived a good, a good life as a, as a writer. Speaking of the West, he says, the West of which I speak is but another name for the wild. And this is one of the reasons this essay has been called often the wild. And what I have been preparing to say is that in wilderness is the preservation of the world. Every tree sends its fiber forth in search of the wild. We cannot help but think of Ruthie's tree at this moment, right? The city's imported at any price. Men plow and sail from it. Um, it and then he says, I believe, sounding very much like Wordsworth in uh, Tentern Abbey, therefore I'm a, love, uh, a worshiper of the meadow and the woods. I believe in the forest and in the meadow and in the night in which the corn grows, 
We require an infusion of hemlock spruce or arbavita in our tea. There is a difference between eating and drinking for strength and from mere gluttony. Of course, everything for Thoreau is, it sounds first extreme, but then he always seems to be able to back away and say, but in moderation, in moderation. He continues, my spirits inevitably rise in proportion to the outward dreariness. Give me the ocean, the desert, or the wilderness. In the desert, pure air and solitude compensate for want of moisture and fertility. A few lines later, a man's health requires as many acres of meadow to his prospect as his farm does loads of muck. He loves to make these kinds of um, observations. In other words, there are parts of a farm that have to be left alone to turn into some kind of muck, swamp that is to say, because that's going to nourish, right, the rest. And then he turns to literature and he talks about uh, literature and the wildness of literature, and we love obviously lines like this one. In literature, it's only the wild that attracts us. I mean, we've said this for a long time. If we're if we're working with texts and they don't wake us up and excite us in some fundamental way, there's there's there's, there's something wrong. Now Thoreau will say in Walden that something wrong might be you. It might not be the text. But notice, we want texts that wake us up, that challenge us in some way. By the way, this is why. The, for us in 303, we say we are the stories that we tell and retell, of course, the stories we accept and reject. But before we get ready to reject a text, we might want to pay very close attention to its wildness, because we might have missed it, right? Dullness is but another name for tameness. It's the uncivilized, free, and wild thinking in Hamlet, and the Iliad, in all the scriptures and mythologies not learned in the schools, that delights us. As the wild duck is more swift and beautiful than the tame, so is the wild, the mallard thought, which mid falling dew wings its way above the fence. A truly good book is something as natural and as unexpectedly and unaccountably fair and perfect as a wild flower discovered on the prairies of the West or in the jungles of the East. Genius is a light which makes the darkness visible like the lightning's flash, which perchance shatters the temple of knowledge itself, the iconoclast, right? And not a taper lighted at the hearthstone of the race, which pales before the light of common day. I mean, pick up, for example, uh, any number of wild texts. I mean, immediately the, the, the books that we love to speak of, uh, Toni Morrison or Alice Walker's. I mean, just think about in the history of great wild books what a book like um, Color Purple does. I mean, it just awakens a certain kind of wildness, a joy, and of course, Thoreau says, that is what we need. Now, he's gonna talk about English literature, of course, and, and, and in moments like this, well, yes, of course, Whitman is probably born, right? I mean, think about the ways in which Whitman had to have heard, he had to have heard Thoreau give this speech, and it had to have awakened in him that sense I got some wild, I got some wild words to speak. He, uh, Thoreau continues, English literature from the days of the minstrels to the late poets, oh, obviously we think about Wordsworth and, and Coleridge, Chaucer and Spencer and Milton and even Shakespeare included breaths, no quiet, fresh, and in this sense, wild strain. In an essential tame and civilized literature reflecting Greece and Rome, her wildness, her wilderness is a green wood. Her wild man, Robin Hood. There is plenty of genial love of nature, but not so much of nature herself. Her chronicles inform us when her wild animals, but not when the wild man in her become extinct. He says, you will perceive that I demand something which no Augustan nor Elizabethan age, which no culture in short can give. Mythology comes nearer to it than anything. How much more fertile a nature, at least, has Grecian mythology its roots in than English literature, exclamation point. Uh, he, uh, of course, we, we follow this line of argument in our, in our celebration, not worship, of course not worship, but celebration of the great epics, right? And we've said a lot about those epics at LearnStrong.net. And, and of course, they're, they're valuable. I mean, obviously, we've got all kinds of ways to criticize them and critique them, but we cannot help but... Pay attention to the wildness of them. They're quite lovely for that, right? How about a line like this? He says, uh, the partridge loves peas, but not those that go with her into the pot. In short, 
All good things are wild and free. There is something in a strain of music, whether produced by an instrument or by the human voice, take the sound of a bugle in a summer night, for instance, which by its wildness to speak without satire reminds me of the cries emitted by the wild beasts in their native forests. It is so much of their wildness, as I can understand. Give me for my friends and neighbors wild men, not tame ones. The wildness of the savage is but a faint symbol of the awful feridity with which good men and lovers meet. And of course, this is a celebration to all the young to say, be wild when you can be wild. I would, he says it a, a few lines later, I would not have any man or nor every part of a man cultivated. Now, I was going to talk about education for a while. Any more than I would have every acre of earth cultivated. Part will be tillage, but the greater part will be meadow and forest, not only serving an immediate use, but preparing a mold against the distant future by the annual decay of the vegetation which it supports. Now, this is brilliant stuff. Uh, and, of course, those of us who love to teach, we love the passage that now is about to come, where... Thoreau's going to talk about schools and what it is that we learn. And, of course, Whitman will make the same critique. It's not that we need to get rid of schools. No, no, no. We obviously need schools in this, in this uh, you know, understanding of education. But they're only good up to, a per, up to a point, right? And then there's all the stuff that goes along outside of school. That is to say, our education is far more than our schooling. Yes, it's a small part. He will talk a little bit about diffusion of useful knowledge. Let's talk about this. We have heard of a society for the diffusion of useful knowledge. It is said that knowledge is power, quoting what many believe Francis Bacon would have said, and the like. Methinks there is equal need for a society in the diffusion of useful ignorance, what we will call beautiful knowledge. A knowledge useful in a higher sense for what is most of our boasted so-called knowledge, but a conceit that we know something which robs us of the advantage of our actual ignorance. Think about our Socrates and our comments on Plato's Apology, right? The only thing I know is that I don't know anything, which is better than believing I know everything. Again, epistemological fallibilism. What we call knowledge is often our positive ignorance. Ignorance, our negative knowledge. By long years of patient industry and reading of the newspapers, for what are the libraries of science but files of newspapers? A man accumulates a myriad facts, lays them up in his memory, and then when in some spring of his life he saunters around in the great fields of thought, he, as it were, goes to grass like a horse and leaves all his harness behind him in the stable. It's a wonderful word picture. In other words, what you're doing right now in your life is learning how to eat hay so that later you can go out in the sunshine summer of your life and eat all the grass you want out on the fields, playing in the fields of language, as we often refer to it, of course, in 303. I would say to the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge, sometimes go to grass. You've eaten hay long enough. The spring has come with its green crop. The very cows are driven to their country pastures before the end of May, though I have heard of one unnatural farmer who kept his cow in the barn and fed her on hay all the year round. So frequently, the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge treats its cattle. I, I think this is brilliant. I mean, I've heard students who often say, why do I got to do Shakespeare I, in university? I'm, I'm a student in the engineering department. I don't need Shakespeare. Thoreau would say, see, here's the problem with that idea. You need life on all of it. And therefore, go to grass. Don't just eat the hay. Although the hay is obviously vital, go to grass. A man's ignorance sometimes is not only useful, but beautiful. While his knowledge, so-called, is oftentimes worse than uselessness, besides being ugly. I mean, I think this is so important. Again, the fallibilist position. Admit that there's a whole lot you don't know. There's something beautiful about this, something wild about that, right? Which is the best man to deal with, who knows nothing about a subject and what is extremely rare, knows that he knows nothing. Here it is, the fallibilist position, epistemologically. Or he who really knows something about it, but thinks that he knows all. My desire for knowledge is intermittent, but my desire to bathe my head in atmospheres unknown to my feet is perennial and constant. The highest that we can attain to is not knowledge, but sympathy with knowledge. Curiosity, right? This is why we say we don't have to like a book. I mean, I don't like 
this book. And therefore, I'm not, no, 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 no. We're, we're not interested in like. We're interested in appreciation, respect. Just as we don't have to like all people, but we must respect them for the positions that they hold. Even if we disagree, mostly when we disagree with them, we must learn to listen to what they have to say, right? I do not know that this higher knowledge amounts to anything more definite than a novel and a grand surprise on a sudden revelation of the insufficiency of all that we called knowledge before, a discovery that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophy. He, of course, has to quote his Hamlet uh, to Horatio from uh, Act One of Hamlet, but he doesn't even put quotation marks around it. It's the lightning up, up uh, by the mist of the sun. He says, we cannot know in any higher sense than this any more than a person can look serenely and with impunity in the face of the sun. Uh, a few lines later, amazingly, he referenced, for example, he references Muhammad. Um, and then a few lines later after that, while almost all men feel an attraction drawing them to society, few are attracted strongly to nature. In the, relationship to, in the relation to nature, men appear to me for the most part notwithstanding their arts, lower than the animals. It's not often a beautiful relation as in the case of the animals. How little appreciation of the beauty of the landscape there is among us, right? That is to say, the Greeks understood beauty and order, but we do not see clarity why they did so. And, and, and we esteem it as, uh, at best, only a curious uh, uh, philological fact. He says, for my part, I feel that with regard to nature, I live a sort of border life on the confines of a world into which I make occasional and transient forays only and my patriotism and allegiance to the state into which into whose territories I seem to retreat are those of a moss trooper. I love this notion of the border life, yes? I mean, this is a beautiful way to think about sociology and, and individualism and the dance between the two. Of course, as Pal Emerson says, if you would be a, a, a person, you must be a nonconformist and all of that. But it's Thoreau who understands the power of the border to move from society into nature and then back again. And of course, uh, metaphorically, there's some power to that notion as well. He says, we hug the earth, how rarely we mount it. He thinks, me thinks we might elevate ourselves a little more. We might climb a tree, at least. And we, you know, we, we think of that, uh, of, the, of the classic moments in literature. Obviously, Frost was very influenced uh, by, this, by this notion in his, uh, in his famous poem, Birches. We've given that lecture as well. Above all, to continue with the road, we cannot afford not to live in the present. Now, this is, of course, part of that notion of always spending our time either in the past or in the future, which, of course, never actually really happens. The past is gone. You can't go back to it. Um, uh, all you can do is somehow recapture it through memory. The future never actually happens. We never get there. The moment we die, it won't be in the future. It will be in the present. And about that, Thoreau says, we cannot afford not to live in the present. He is blessed above all mortals who loses no moment of the passing life in Remembering the past, uh, a contemporary, of course, Longfellow, trust no future in the psalm of life, however pleasant, let the dead past bury the dead, act, act in the living present. Unless our philosophy hears the cock crow in every barnyard within our horizon, it is belated. And again, notice that movement between the literal and the metaphor is quite brilliant. That sound commonly reminds us that we are growing rusty and antique in our employments and habits of thought. Wow, what a great line. Are you finding yourself already growing rusty and antique in your employments and habits of thought? That is to say, wake up. This is, of course, this notion of wake up and come alive again to the wildness of ideas and the wildness of the life that you can live with those ideas, right? His philosophy comes down to a more recent time than ours. There is something suggested by it that is a newer testament, the gospel according to this moment. He has not fallen astern. He has got up early and kept up early. And to be where he is is to be in season, in the foremost rank of time. It's an expression of the health and soundness of nature, a brag for all the world. Healthiness as of a spring burst forth, a new fountain of the muses to celebrate this last instant of time where he lives no fugitive slave laws are passed. Of course, the brilliance of Thoreau pointing out already that the abolitionist movement will win. And in the end, even because of a civil war, America will be better for it.
Who has not betrayed his master many times since last he heard that note? Well, the way he finishes this brilliant, brilliant essay is to talk about a sunset. And of course, there's brilliance about this because he'll start in the morning and end in the evening. Uh, he says it this way. We had a remarkable sunset one day last November. And this kind of like <clears throat> folksy, um, hey, let me tell you a story, you know, to finish this essay, which was, of course, a lecture to begin with, uh, will remind us a lot of Walden. Like I said, learning how to read walking can help you to read Walden, I believe. He says, I was walking in a meadow the source of a small brook, when the sun at last, just before setting, after a cold gray day, reached a clear stratum in the horizon, and the softest, brightest morning sunlight fell on the dry grass and on the stems of the trees and the opposite horizon and on the leaves of the shrub oaks on the hillside, while our shadows stretched long over the meadow eastward, as if we were the only motes in the beams. It was such a light as we could not have imagined a moment before. And the air also was so warm and serene that nothing was wanting to make a paradise of that meadow. When we reflected that this was not a solitary phenomenon, never to happen again, but that it would happen forever and an ever an infinite number of evenings and cheer and reassure the last child that walked there, it was more glorious still. The sun sets on some retired meadow where no house is visible with all the glory and splendor that it lavishes on cities, and perchance, as it has never set before, where there is but a solitary marsh hawk to have his wings glided on by, or only a mushquash looks out from his cabin and there is some little black veined brook in the midst of the marsh, just beginning to meander, winding slowly round a decaying stump. We walked in so pure and bright a light, guiding the withered grass and leaves so softly and serenely bright, I thought I had never bathed in so.